Hello and welcome to the Secondary Storage Ecocast event. On today's event, we're excited to be joined by Cohesity and Pure Storage. My name is David Davis, and I'm the moderator for today's event. I'm a partner at Actual Tech Media, and I, let me give you a little bit of background on the Ecocast and Megacast event series. If you haven't joined us before, um, we at Actual Tech Media created the Ecocast event series to help educate the world of IT professionals about the most innovative enterprise-grade technology solutions available to you today to help you to learn as much as you can, to help you get all your questions answered and do it as efficiently as possible in one online virtual event. You never have to leave your home office or work office and go downtown to the convention center to learn about the latest in enterprise tech, you can do it all on the Megacast and Ecocast events. And these have been super popular for us and uh, very popular with attendees as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. I know as a former IT professional myself, uh, life is very busy in IT. And so thank you for taking some time out of your day to learn about secondary storage. And I emphasize learn because we want this to be a very educational event. And while you're learning, you'll have a chance to win one of our very cool prizes as well. So, so the format for today's event is you'll hear from, on, on today's event, two of the hottest companies in the secondary storage space today. Uh, each one will speak for roughly 20 minutes, followed by a live three to five minute Q&A session where I'll take the best questions from you out there in the audience, and I'll be asking those of today's presenters. So this is not a competition between the presenters. Again, an educational event for you. So before we get into it, I've got a little bit of housekeeping here. I first need to cover. Today we'll be giving out three Tango $500 gift cards. And if you aren't familiar with Tango gift cards, um, I wasn't not too long ago. So let me tell you briefly about what these are. Uh, these are cards that can be used with top retailers, including Amazon, Starbucks, Target, Apple. So basically, instead of giving you a gift card for one specific place, uh, the Tango gift card, what's cool about it is you can use it you know, at many different you know, top retailers. You can also choose to donate the value of the gift card to charities like Habitat for Humanity and Girls Who Code, um, and there's no expiration date on these cards as well. So a lot of different possibilities with the Tango gift card, and that's the main reason that we've chosen to give those away today. Uh, I'll be covering the requirements to be eligible for those prize drawings in the next few slides. I also want to mention the questions and answers box. It's on the left-hand side of your console. I see some attendees already saying good morning. Um, thank you for those. Thank you for sharing your good morning messages. I'll be uh, posting all those, approving all those comments uh, as soon as they come in. And we encourage you to use that questions and answers box as much as you'd like throughout the presentation. Don't wait for the dedicated Q&A session. Ask your questions throughout the presentations. We have experts available standing by to answer those questions. I'll be queuing up the best questions for the presenters uh, during the live Q&A, and we'll be, we'll be answering as many of the questions as we can. Uh, we get hundreds of questions during these events, so if you don't see your question answered quickly, uh, I appreciate your patience. Uh, during that. Uh, I also have a number of poll questions for you. I'll be popping up some poll questions for you all to answer, and I'll be sharing the results of those polls with you. So, you know, I encourage you to answer those poll questions, and you can see how you stack up with your peers who are on today's event. Um, finally, um, well, not finally, one more thing, social. Uh, we encourage this, uh, we encourage you to promote this event on Twitter. The hashtag for today's event is Storage Ecocast. And I will share that hashtag with you in a, a minute, just as um, soon as I'm done with this slide. I'll be monitoring that hashtag throughout the event. I'll be retweeting tweets that use the storage ecocast hashtag and probably following just about anyone who tweets using the hashtag. And then lastly, fi final thing on this slide uh, are resources. On the left-hand side of your console, next to the questions and answers box, there is a handouts tab. If you click on handouts, we have a number of handouts from today's sponsors. I encourage you to check those out, download them, share them with your friends, family. And then finally, the console. This console that you're looking at in your web browser, it's kind of like a windowed operating system. You can take the questions and answers box, the slides window, you can drag these around. You can maximize them. Uh, we hope you don't minimize them, but you can maximize them 
And I encourage you to do that so that you can see the live demonstrations that will be happening today. We've got live screen shares of the products. We have architectural diagrams. So make sure you maximize uh, the slides window as much as your browser you know, will support. So with that, let's talk just briefly about these three Tango gift cards we'll be giving away today. To be eligible for the prize drawings, you must be on the live event. If you're watching this event on demand, after the live event has occurred, I'm sorry, the prize drawings have already happened. Uh, grand prize winners, who or anyone who wins more than $600 from Actual Tech Media during a calendar year must have been an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. And the full prize details are available on our website. They're also available if you click on the Handouts tab and click on Prize Terms and Conditions. Now through the Megacast and Ecocast event series, thanks to generous attendees who have won prizes, we've given out thousands of dollars to the charities that you see on the screen here. If you win one of these prizes and you'd like to donate your prize value to charity, we would love to help you do that, and we encourage you to do that as well. Uh, social media, I mentioned the hashtag for today is Storage Ecocast. Today's event is produced by Actual Tech Media. You can follow us on Twitter. And I am David M. Davis. You can follow me on Twitter as well. And then finally, um, you can follow Actual Tech Media over on Facebook, on our YouTube channel. And we also have a podcast called the 10 on Tech Podcast over in the iTunes store. Now, before we jump into this with our first presenter today, I want to do a little bit of you know, level setting here to make sure that everyone's familiar with the term secondary storage. You may be joining this event and you might be wondering, you know, just what exactly is secondary storage? What do you mean by that? Well, secondary storage, to define it, I want you to first envision your primary data set. So that could be your point of sale system, your HR data, general ledger, finance, uh, manufacturing system, whatever your primary data set is. And then think about all the other data. The secondary storage is basically everything else that's not your primary data. So the secondary data is your backup data. And, you know, maybe you keep multiple backup data sets. You have archival data. You're required to keep that for, um, you know, maybe seven years, for example, for uh, legal requirements. You have logging data, security data, all sorts of different logs that are you know, being created every second. And you have multiple copies even of your primary data that you use for testing and for development. And this, pri this, this secondary data that you have is, is growing. You know, it's growing um, not just on our personal you know, laptops where we're running out of space, but it's growing massively at companies as most of you as IT professionals well know. And so, you know, our first presenter today, uh, Mr. Chris Colotti from Cohesity, uh, in many, uh, many presentations they've done, they've talked about kind of the iceberg analogy. And I know that Chris isn't going to cover that today, so let me share with you the iceberg analogy when it comes to secondary storage. Um, I think the iceberg is a great visual for this because, you know, the very tip of the iceberg uh, sticks out of the water, isn't very big, and that's your primary data set. But the massive amount of data that's below the water, the massive you know, iceberg that you don't see, that's your secondary data. And I typically think of you know, secondary data as being um, where the 80-20 rule applies, meaning your primary data is the 20% that sticks out of the top. Uh, your secondary data is the 80% that's below the water line that you don't even think about. And it's that 80%, and in some cases it's 90% of your data that's, that's massively growing. So that's what secondary data is. And I know that we in IT typically struggle to manage you know, our backup data, logging, archival, multiple data sets. It's that type of data that we're really struggling to manage and deal with. And I'm thankful that we have two of the best uh, storage solutions being presented in the industry today on today's event from Cohesity and Pure Storage. Now, before we jump into it with our first presenter, I've got just a couple poll questions here that I'd like to ask you out there in the audience, and I'll share the results of these with you. Uh, the first one on the screen is, how many people work at your company? Should be an easy question to answer. I see some votes already coming in, 
So I'll give you a moment to answer this and then I'll share the results with you. All right, and as you can see, it looks like 17% are at 10,000 plus companies. Uh, oh, we have a tie here for 1,000 to 2,500 and 100 to 500, 19% of the audience. Uh, real good representation all the way down to very small companies as well. Uh, one to 25 make up 3% of today's event. So thank you for voting on that poll question. I'm gonna pop up the next one now. That is, what's your industry vertical? And on this one, you may need to use a slider on the right-hand side of the slide window to scroll down, because as you can guess, there's a lot of different verticals in the world today. I'm curious to find out what's the industry out there that struggles most with secondary data. Perhaps this is a telling sign. All right, looks like most of the audience has voted. Let me share the results of this with you. Okay, it looks like 17% technology, uh, but followed by 12% manufacturing and 12% healthcare. So I think that's very interesting. Interesting. Obviously, those industries, you know, create a lot of data. We also have finance and banking, telecom, education, state, local governments, uh, all represented on the event today. So thank you for voting on that. And then last question before we jump into the first presentation. That is on the screen, and it's what's your time frame for updating your existing or selecting a new storage infrastructure solution like those you'll hear about on today's event? All right, looks like most everyone has voted on that poll. Thank you for those votes. I do appreciate it. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter on today's Storage Ecocast. That is Mr. Chris Collotti, Principal Technologist at Cohesity. Chris, are you with us? Yes. Can you hear me, David? I can. Yeah. Thanks for being on. I appreciate it. And you know what? I actually, uh, I think your iceberg slide was, was quite nice looking, actually. I, uh, I got to get that image. Um, and I do appreciate you pointing that out. I mean, we talk a lot about that. Uh, and today I'm going to, there's a lot that Cohesity can talk about when it comes to secondary storage. And Topic-wise, what I want to try to do is hit, uh, you know, one aspect of it that we, um, and that's uh, ransomware specifically where it relates to the secondary storage. So a couple months ago, uh, Kaisi released a solution to help deal with ransomware, and, and I'm going to hopefully touch on the marketplace a little bit, which was announced this week, uh, last week as well. So uh, always a ton of information, so we've got to dial it down for, for 20 minutes. So uh, real quick, for those who don't know who Cohesity is, uh, the typical uh, logo slide, but we are we were founded in 2013 uh, by Mohit Aaron. Uh, you know, we uh, have an experienced team from Nutanix, Google, VMware, uh, all over the place. Uh, some really good uh, investment houses as well, and, and as you can see, some some good uh, customer pedigree. So let me talk a little bit about um, you know ransomware. You know, we all know ransomware is out there. Uh, it, it affects not only the users, but it affects production app servers, uh, but it actually affects production uh, legacy as well, or, or legacy backups. So how do we actually try to uh, contend with that? Um, so we all know, you know, it comes in from a user. Uh, it tends to initially affect the production app servers. And if it happens to protect, uh, infect legacy backups, what it actually does is it prevents us from actually restoring, right? So these things are getting smarter and not only just attacking the existing production data, but they're going after the backup copies so that we can't actually bring back to a, a stable state. So if you go to the next slide real quick um, and click through those animations, you know, Cohesity actually deals with this a couple of ways. One, we have a three-phase approach. So we do prevent, detect, respond is how we, is how we call it. So the first thing we do is, is we have an immutable file system. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about data lock, which is a new feature where we can layer on another uh, re, uh, write once, read many functionality on both backups as well as files. Uh, Helios, which is our, our global uh, management tool, can actually do detection based on data change rates and other things. Uh, and then finally, we can respond to it by doing what we call an instant mass restore, and I'll actually demo uh, that as well quickly uh, when we go through this. I actually like to jump jump and get into the demo. So. Real quick, what DataLock does, DataLock was announced uh, a couple months ago. This is our ability to 
lock snapshots during backup cycles. So you can actually uh, keep them from being modified whatsoever on the file system. So it's a layer on top of the immutable file system. Uh, this is, you know, meets a lot of compliance requirements. Uh, it has expirations on it, things like that. There's a single user role, which I'll show everybody, that can perform this operation. So it has to be the data security admin. Uh, even the system admin within the Khaleesi platform doesn't have that role. So it's simply turned on at a policy level, and then every backup from there on uh, is actually data locked for a particular period of time. Uh, and when, they're, when the retention expires, then the data lock expires. Um, where, we're, where we'll, we will actually see this in the demo is, is I'll show where it's uh, actually turned on in the, in the policy-based control for the backups. So if you can click through these one at a time, David. Um, the legal hold is a little bit different. So data lock is sort of a preemptive approach. So you know you want to take a particular set of uh, backups and a policy and say, I want to lock everything from this point on for a certain period of time. Legal hold, we apply after a potential event. So we can actually go in and do legal hold on an individual run of backups and say, this backup in time, uh, something happened uh, that we need to meet for compliance purposes, and we can lock this one rundown. I'll actually show everybody that. I think I showed this in context of an Office 365 uh, demo a couple months ago. Um, the one thing we point out is there is, you know, there's a couple of interesting warnings that pop up because when you actually put legal hold on, it's on until that, that data storage admin or that uh, uh, data privacy admin turns it off. So that will sit on storage basically and forever until they, until they disable it. And you can see once we enable it, there's simply a, a, a legal button or a legal icon next to it on Data Protect. We'll see that there's actually a different icon that we, pre that we present. So uh, one of the things um, you know, that, that, that we always talk about is Instant Mass Restore. And uh, we do this through at any point in time, uh, and we can do it at scale. So I'm actually going to show you how the process runs in the background. Uh, we'll, we'll jump between Virtual Center and the Coelicity Client so you can see it. But when we go to the next slide, the, the, where we see the issues with um, restoring with, with previous, uh, previous technology is there's, there's t t tends to be three ways to do this, right? The first way is the old traditional approach, which is you restore uh, the last snapshot, and then you apply everything incrementally on top of that, and you have to wait for all of that to complete until uh, your, your VM is then hydrated. The second approach is, is a little bit in the middle where your incrementals are at least chained together, uh, so it's a little bit faster, so it, it does uh, decrease the time a little bit, but it, it has some limited scale. Coincity's approach, which is what I'll show you, is every one of our snapshots, whether it's locked or legal held or, or anything that's applied to it, is a, is a fully hydrated image. That means at any point in time, all of the incrementals are already applied, and we can restore from any, uh, any backup and any snapshot in time and instantly restore that version uh, and get the VM back up and running. So uh, that's about enough slideware as, mu as much as I like to do. So let me, um, let me actually share my screen out here and actually get into some of the, the demos of this. And as the questions come in, uh, we'll try to grab those as well. So let's see if the share works. Hopefully you can see my screen, David. I do. Uh-huh. So the first thing I want to show is the Helios dashboard. So this is where we actually do the detection capability. So you can see uh, I've actually got a bunch of clusters in here. One's running in uh, Amazon, one's running in Azure. I've got a couple of local boxes. And I'll actually show you an example of one of the alerts because these, you know, these do tend to pop for different reasons. I think I've got some because I did some massive updates uh, to, uh, to a couple of VMs and it, it actually showed a very high data change rate. So you can see, you know, they come in as these data ingest anomalies. And what we see is we see a, a huge change at a point in time. So this is the detection piece of it. Uh, and from here, we're able to see which, which VM it was. Uh, looks like it was my, my desktop, actually. That's interesting. <laughs> my view desktop, that's mine. Uh, we can inspect this to see exactly, you know, it'll, it'll bring us right to that point in time where it saw that, that that high data change written. So you can see here, there's about a, a 1.2 gig. Uh, if we go back, um, oops, I gotta be back on all clusters. Uh, we can actually do an instant recovery. And what it will do is it will pick a point in time that is its best guess before the event of where we wanna restore this VM from. Um, so now I could restore this one VM, but actually, uh, and I can, I can actually kick this off so we can take a look at the process. So every VM we restore is, is considered an instant restore. So I will actually give some props to some other vendors out there. We didn't, 
necessarily invent the way we're going to do it, but we actually do it a little bit better. We complete the process. So there's, there's some folks that have been doing something similar to the process I'm going to show you, but we take the very last step and we've already automated that, which is, is actually a storage of emotion on the back end. So I'm just going to put a quick test on here. I'm going to restore this to a new location. Uh, we'll store this to the compute side. We'll put this on this nimble array. Uh, and I'm just going to stick this down in a, in a folder here. We've got a lot of folders. So I'll stick that in this one. Doesn't really matter. Uh, and I'm actually going to let this power on, uh, but I'm going to just detach the network so I don't have a conflict with my desktop. So what I want to show is as this is running, I'm actually going to jump over to vSphere for a second here. And the first thing we'll notice is this, this data store just got created. So we'll see that uh, down here, uh, this is now being mounted by Virtual Center to bring this VM online. So this is actually powered on right now as we can probably go see under my templates where I dropped it. Get this one. So you can see here, this is the VM with a prefix, test desktop CC. It's already powered on. Uh, but what you'll notice is it's actually doing a storage vMotion. So this is the final phase. So again, if we did this on 100 VMs or 60 VMs or 10 VMs, the process is exactly the same. So we present all the VMs. We present an NFS data store that's running on Cohesity, and we can actually look at this from a back-end perspective and see that it's being backed by my Cohesity and a, uh, NFS mount point. And once the storage vMotion is done, so the instant part is the VM is ready, it's powered on, the user can be accessing it, it just happens to be sitting on a temporary data store. We finish the process by doing this vMotion automatically to the final, the final location, which was the nimble, uh, the nimble array, which I told it to drop it onto. And then we'll clean up and remove this, uh, this data store. So if a ransomware attack happens, we can literally uh, go in and I'll actually show you one, uh, one larger segment of this where we have, uh, we have a bunch of VMs that we did last week on a test. We can do a global search and I can find every VM uh, just by doing a wildcard uh, search within the system. And I have this giant IMR uh, job that uh, we use for demonstra demonstration purposes. It's got about 60 VMs in it. So if I was to kick this off, uh, I could do the same exact process and all 60 VMs would individually, one by one, be readily available within minutes. I think the whole process on those 60 VMs with the vMotion, with the storage vMotion part, takes about 50 minutes because you've got to do all the storage copies. And we know storage vMotion is literally moving bits from uh, one device to another through, you know, through the ESX host. So we, don't, we, we typically do one to show the, the underlying functionality with everything getting powered on. But doesn't matter. We could do this with 100 VMs or 1,000 VMs. It really has no, no scale limitation. So the other thing I want to point out that I talked about is uh, the legal hold piece, which I actually need to uh, log in locally because legal hold is, is like I said, it's that specific role. So we actually look, if we look at our access management and we look at our roles, uh, we've got this one called data security. Uh, and a user has to be part of that to see the options that I'm going to show. So the first option is under a protection job. Uh, if I actually go and edit one of these protection jobs that's running, uh, I'll actually edit this one, which is the IMR one. Uh, we'll see under the policy, I can actually data lock this. And you'll see that, that warning that I showed in the screenshot will come up. It doesn't data lock anything that's already been run, but it will data lock any, any run from this point on. Uh, and we would not be able to delete it or edit it or change it until it expires or the, the uh, data security admin um, actually takes control against that. The difference between that and uh, legal hold is if I go to one of my jobs that's already been run, so these jobs have already been run. We have a bunch of these things are always backing up our infrastructure. This is a, a sort of a production lab, so we keep everything backed up on our own dog food. I can actually pick any one of these snapshots in time and I can edit that run, and I can now legal hold just that individual run. So it's a little bit easier to show because it instantly holds that snapshot uh, forever until, until I decide to unlock it or take it off of the legal hold. And then this one would be preserved uh, until you know, the legal, pro legal proceedings or anything that we need that data for is, is over. Um, I'm actually going to take that off now. So from a ransomware approach, we're able to not only do a, 
uh, data locking on the file system. We can do this as well on views. So uh, Khaleesi can act as a as a NFS file system as well, obviously, because we're we're mounting it to restore. You can see in a previous test, we actually data locked uh, an, a file share. So the entire share is actually locked, and nothing can be uh, edited on that on that um, NFS or SMB file share. We can still drop files on it. They would get locked as they get loaded to it. So that's another interesting concept is you can create a file share, tell it to lock the data. It doesn't prevent you from adding data to it. It just simply prevents you from deleting. So it's, uh, I, I call it the Hotel California uh, scenario. Um, you can get in, but it's very difficult to get out unless we actually unlock it. But that's what the data lock icon would look like if it was applied. And then we can clone views as a data locked view, which completely locks it down. We can't write anything to it. Uh, we can't do anything with it. So if I actually was going to do that, you can see here I've got uh, uh, an NFS and SMB uh, views with about 700 gig on it. If I was to clone this, and this is another interesting part of the demo, is this will clone that 700 gigs um, pretty much instantly. But I can create a, a data lock view of this, which will create a new copy of all of the data. It will put it, uh, I can set some QoS on it, and this view will be, uh, this copy of all that data will be unable to be edited whatsoever. So if I go back and look, uh, now I've got my data locked copy that's also 700 gigs. Uh, it's accessible through SMB, but I wouldn't be able to actually edit anything on there. So uh, you can also note that you know I copied 700 gigs worth of media files instantly on the platform. So I'll pause there quickly. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions. It looks like there's a bunch of them. Uh, and then I can do a quick quick overview of the Cohesity Marketplace, which we announced last week, which has gotten a lot of interest. So uh, pick some of these here, David. Uh, restoring a specific yeah. file from backup. So yes, Jared, we can. So if it's a virtual machine, uh, we do index the entire virtual machine, and we can restore an individual file. Um, we can download it to a local machine, but we can actually search for it as well. Um, but yeah, if it's we index all the virtual machines that happen to be protected on the platform, so every single file is indexed. Yeah, this is an interesting one from Michael. Does Cohesity take one full forever? And then if so, what if there's a retention period on backups, you know, kind of down the road? What happens to the full and the restore capabilities? Yep, so that's a good question. I'll, I'll try to explain it as best I can. So when we when we actually create, it's sometimes easier to show it too. When we create the protection policy and we look at uh, this one happens to be running uh, a schedule every four hours retained for 30 days. It happens to be set to incremental only, but we could do an incremental with a full every every number of days. So we can actually pick uh, the number of days we want to do that. We can then do extended retentions. Um, some folks, we had a customer who has a very extensive retention policy. It's, it's actually quite difficult to follow because of how he does it. But it's, uh, you know, he does fulls every 30 days. He does incrementals otherwise. Uh, as far as what happens to the data, once they expire, they expire. But it, it doesn't matter because every single, you have to kind of go back to that original statement that I made is every incremental that's taken is a fully hydrated version. So it doesn't matter if it's a full or not. Um, most customers that we see, uh, we see them just, you know, doing the, the full will always happen on the first, first backup. So the minute you create a new job and you set it up, it will take a full, even though you set the job to incremental, it has to take a full. Um, everything beyond that is incrementals. If people elect to do a full later, they can, um, but a lot of customers don't have to because every single one of those incremental snapshots is a fully hydrated version. So kind of a debate on whether you need, I haven't been convinced one way or the other personally, whether you need the full every 30 days or, you know, what, what you will get out of it because of that 30 day incremental is still a fully hydrated snapshot. I could go back to anything in that tree and restore it as instantly as I did uh, with that one VM that was only a couple days old. Okay, very nice. Another question here they're asking, what's the minimum size of data storage with Cohesity? Kind of like what's the entry point of the smallest? Yeah. Um, David knows this. I'm not a sales guy. I, it's three nodes for a cluster. So we, you know, our partners, HP, HPE, Dell, and uh, Cisco, as well as our own chassis, they're typically hyper-converged four-node capable chassis. Uh, three nodes is the minimum to build a cluster. Uh, the node sizing varies as far as raw storage. I think the one that I'm running on here, as an example, is one of the, the smaller ones. It happens to be a four-node. 
and I believe we've got you know about 90 90 terabytes uh, usable. Um, but we can also lose an entire node and still maintain that, right? So um, a lot of customers start out with a three-node chassis that's got a little bit, you know, smaller disks than, than I have here. I can't remember if this is the absolute bare minimum that we got. We were under a budget for the new lab. I've got another cluster that might, um, this other one actually, if we look at it, may have slightly different storage on it, just out of curiosity. Uh, no, this one's about the same size. So this is an older one. This is a C2500. The new one's a C2505 that I have, but they're both four-node. Uh, clusters with about the same storage. My and my I, best suggestion is get in, get in touch with the SE that's local. They can they can give you the sizing, but it is a minimum of three nodes to build the cluster. Okay. Another question here, Michael. He's asking, can Cohesity back up physical servers? Yes, we always get that, and I know it's it's a ton of information, but a great question, Michael. Again, best way to show you is to show the things we can protect. So you can see here uh, that we can protect. Uh, physical servers, virtual servers, uh, views, which are our file shares, uh, SQL server databases, Oracle databases, uh, Oracle adapters, uh, peers coming on. We actually have peer integration uh, to use peer snapshots. And we can just do basic NAS, right? So we can just back, back up a, a basic NAS file share as well as Office 365. So the, the amount of sources is constantly growing, actually. And although it looks short, uh, the one thing I'll point out is if I pick hypervisor, it's not just virtual center, right? It's virtual center. It's standalone ESX host. It's uh, vCloud director, Hyper-V, uh, GCP, AWS, Azure, right? So that one bucket of hypervisor includes, you know, six different things. Um, so it, it's it's a very ex extensive set that continues to grow. Okay. And Michael's question is kind of a two-part question. How does this compare to, you know, traditional legacy backup solutions? Like what's, I mean, you're showing some of the benefits here, but kind of what are people replacing those legacy backup solutions with Cohesity? Yeah, we actually are seeing a lot of customers, you know, removing older solutions and migrating to Cohesity because the 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 first, and this is this is where kind of the marketplace will come in. Uh, and I know Dave will cut me off when we hit time, but. Um, the platform isn't just about backup, right? We always explain it as a data platform. So the first major use case is backup. So yes, a lot of customers, their first use case is to, to come in and start doing more efficient backups. Uh, I think I backed up earlier uh, all 60 of those VMs uh, in this new cluster that I built. Uh, we can actually look at the job in about 12 minutes, right? So it was 60 virtual machines all backed up uh, through multiple streams to the four nodes. Uh, in less than, you know, 20 minutes. So uh, 17 minutes. It took me from, and that was the very first, so you can see it's the only backup job, so it was a full. So a full backup of 60 virtual machines in 17 minutes along with the indexing component. So it's about performance on the backups. It's about the number of copies. It's about how it's stored. We can replicate to another Cohesity appliance. We can do offload and archive to cloud. Like I said, there's way more than 20 minutes worth of, of information about what Cohesity does, let alone the, the NAS component that we bring into it. So what we're seeing is people bringing in the platform, starting with backup, and then growing out into these other things. So as a good segue, we announced uh, the Cohesity Marketplace, which is, is live, and that's our ability to actually run applications, specific applications, on the data platform to run operations like analytics against the backup copies. So this is, this is really unique because this is what Mohit calls bringing the compute to the data as opposed to the data to the compute. The data is already on our platform. We have some compute on our platform. We have cycles where that compute may not be used. We can now deploy applications directly onto the platform and let people run those applications and leverage uh, the, the backup copies of the data. So you can see here, uh, I don't have any apps installed, but when you go from the marketplace to the Cohesity side, you can see we've got our own Cohesity Insight app that does some indexing. We can run Splunk. We can run Clam AV. That's just a few of what's in the marketplace. What I want to be clear about is the apps that will be in the App Store are intended to be apps that will leverage that data, right? So if it's not an app that, that's going to directly use the data that's there, uh, it probably won't live in the App Store, right? I don't, I don't want to I don't want to overshadow what we're doing. It, it's really about um, having applications that can run against the backup copies readily available on the platform. So very, very unique, but that's just another thing the platform can do. So it, it really has expanded well away from, from backup and data protection, although that's still kind of the core DNA. Excellent. I love the new app store. I, I saw Mohit 
announcing the the new app store uh, functionality and i think i think it's really exciting so i'm excited to see you know the future of the cohesity app store um let's see i think that's all the time we probably have um let's see a couple other questions that came in uh, one of them is cohesity hardware or software <laughs> We, we are a software company, right? Most of our customers run our software on our partner's hardware. So, you know, David, you and I joke about this, right? You can't just have software without having hardware. So it's always an interesting question. Um, you got to run it somewhere. But the, the partners we have with Dell and HPE and, and um, um, Cisco, they have certified hyperconverged nodes that, that have been certified to run our software. So that's the best way to describe it. We also have Cloud Edition versions that are software-based. So there's a Cloud Edition for Azure, GCP, uh, for um, uh, AWS, as well as now we've got a clustered VE version. So you can run a single node virtual edition on vSphere, or you can now run a clustered version on vSphere. So it, it truly is a software DNA. Uh, at some point, there's got to be some compute and some memory to actually run the software. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, I don't know if there's any other more technical questions you want to answer there. If so, feel free to. If not, you can get to those, you know, after. But um, the other question. Uh, I the have for the you only one I'll point out is, is Michael. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can talk afterwards. He's got a 12 node cluster from Cohesity and getting ready to set up some policies. So probably, I don't know if that, there's any pitfalls. Uh, it's kind of open to you, but uh, certainly you can you can hit me up afterwards or be happy to, you know, get on, get on a call with you afterwards. So. Awesome. Yeah. The last question I had is, what should people do if they're interested in Cohesity? What's the easiest way to, to try it out? Uh, <clears throat> best way is to, one, get in touch with, uh, with a local SE. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you know, you can reach out to uh, corporate and call right into the inside sales team. Um, we can do live demos. Uh, go to the VMUGs, the trade shows. We're at all of those. Uh, and I'll, I'll take the lob on this one. There is a massive demo truck that drives around the country uh, that has Cohesity written all over the outside of it um, that John Hildenbrand and myself had a pretty big hand in building the, the data center. It provides live demos from a real running data center. So um, there's Cohesity.com slash tour that you can find out where that is and get some stick time and some hands-on and talk directly to SEs. So plenty of places to see it uh, and get demos for it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you want to stop the screen share there, Chris, I appreciate that. Um, great presentation, as usual. Thank you so much for being on the event today. No problem. Thanks for having me, as always. For more information on Cohesity, visit, of course, Cohesity.com. They're, they're on all the social media there. Uh, but also check out the handout that's available right there in your audience console. If you click on the Handouts tab, that handout is how Cohesity – uh, is able to counter ransomware attacks and respond. Uh, very cool stuff. It's a real technical handout, so make sure you check that out. And with that, it is time for our first gift card giveaway. We have a Tango gift card, and that Tango gift card is uh, $500. And I'm bringing up the prize winner now. That first prize winner is Tony Esposito from Texas. Congratulations, Tony, from Texas. We've got two more $500 gift cards to give away at the end of this event. And before we start the next presentation, I've got a poll question for you. It's on the screen right now, and it says, what additional information would you like from Cohesity? This is a multi-select question. We're curious to find out what additional information you would like uh, to help you learn more about the Cohesity solution that you just saw a demo of. Um, I want to re-announce the prize winners. Some uh, questions came in about who was the prize winner. Tony Esposito from Texas for an, a Tango $500 gift card. We've got two more $500 gift cards to give away right after our next presentation. So make sure that you stay tuned for those. All right, I appreciate everyone answering that poll question. Really good info. Thank you very much. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter on today's event. That is Mr. Sean Aquino. He is a Solutions Marketing Manager at Pure Storage. Welcome to our webinar, Ushering in the Modern Era of Data Protection 
Introducing Pure Storage Object Engine. My name is Sean Aquino and I'm a Senior Solutions Marketing Manager at Pure. I'm pleased to introduce Object Engine, what we at Pure call the industry's first flash-to-flash-to-cloud -flash 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 platform for data protection. This solution will help you to significantly improve data protection operations, particularly in the area of restore performance, save money through storage efficiency and infrastructure flexibility, and simplify data reuse for workloads beyond backup. We'll cover Object Engine in more detail, but first I'd like to provide context for why we're launching it. Our first point is data protection doesn't equal business protection insofar as recoverability is questionable. We've seen this from customers deploying FlashBlade to facilitate much faster data recovery. Here we see some serious implications of not being able to restore data in a timely fashion. One of our customers, a global legal services firm, lost two terabytes of production data. A DBA accidentally deleted a production database. Using a purpose-built backup appliance, or PBBA, it took them 36 hours to restore. That's a day and a half of lost productivity. Another customer, a large auto supplier, experienced a recent ransomware attack that impacted their ability to ship parcels. Using an old PBBA, it took them seven days to restore systems back online, and this resulted in a $20,000 penalty per parcel not shipped on time. That's revenue impact and potential loss of opportunities. It's interesting to note this customer later implemented FlashBlade and restores were streamlined from days to minutes. Independent consulting firms have also been tracking the poor restore performance of PBBA systems. In a blog, DCAC estimated it would take 25 days to restore a nearly six terabyte database. It was only an estimation because when testing a restore, they killed the job after 24 hours with only 2% of the job completed. Our second point is more is expected of backup data. We see data reuse interest with customers in test dev, malware detection, analytics, AI, and GDPR and privacy. Let's pause for a moment on the general data protection regulation. It mandates specific rules for any organization that manages private data for the citizens of the European Union you have to demonstrate you can adequately safeguard that private information. You need to be able to respond to subject access requests. There are many other provisions, however, for those who rely solely on their data protection solution to address the requirements, non-compliance can spell significant penalties. Imagine not being able to recover relevant data for a subject access request within the prescribed timelines. Yet most enterprises are stuck in an old era mindset that data is meant to be stored away only useful when the unexpected disaster strikes. They've designed their data protection strategy on a disk to disk to tape approach. This is where production applications like Oracle, VMware, or SQL reside on a primary disk and are backed up to a secondary disk or disk-based purpose-built backup appliance, PBBA. These systems are replicated to an offsite location for disaster recovery purposes. Tape is introduced on-premises and is brought off-site for disaster recovery, and some companies back up their off-site PBBAs to tape for extra protection. But there are three challenges with this approach. First, when it's time to restore data, it's significantly slower than backup. Second, there's tremendous waste in this architecture. As mentioned previously, PBBAs are typically replicated to a second set of PBBAs off-site for disaster recovery. In addition, customers often pre-buy capacity in anticipation of future use. A lot of money is spent on things that could be avoided with a more modern approach. Third, once data goes onto tape, it goes dark, meaning it's out of reach and offers zero value offsite while waiting to be recalled, if ever. If data is truly the most important asset in an enterprise, this approach goes completely counter to it. After decades of the same disk to disk to tape approach, a new standard emerges, flash to flash to cloud or F to F to C. With flash and cloud, enterprises can get all that was great with the old approach and much more. Backup data fast and efficiently. Restore data nearly as fast. Save money through cloud economics and infrastructure efficiencies. And streamline data reuse on-prem and potentially in the cloud. Yet up to now, flash to flash to cloud has not been possible. You can't just smash all flash storage together with cloud. A missing technology is needed to bridge on-prem and cloud in a seamless way. It must be cloud-native by design, not built on-prem and then ported to the cloud. 
It must be compatible with the backup applications customers are using. It must be high performance for both backup and more importantly restore while delivering inline deduplication for cost efficiency. It must overcome the backup data silos incurred by the disk to disk to tape approach. And it must embrace hybrid cloud as more and more organizations are moving to this model. For pure storage, that missing technology was already being delivered by a company named Store Reduce. So back in August 2018, Pure made its first acquisition and that company was Store Reduce. We saw they demonstrated a unique opportunity to modernize the data protection market and they delivered on all the requirements we mentioned previously for flash to flash to cloud to become reality. Store Reduce technology was born in the cloud, then brought on-premises to bridge a true hybrid infrastructure. It's cloud native and offers a scale out architecture to help customers grow performance and capacity as needed. Object Engine is Store Reduce technology rebranded, enhanced, and delivered by Pure Storage. It's comprised of two products that will bridge on-prem and public cloud for data protection. Initially, Object Engine will be available as a four-node cluster in a reference architecture with FlashBlade to enable fast restores on-prem. In a subsequent release, we extend Object Engine so it can write deduplicated backup data to the public cloud, starting with AWS. And later, Object Engine Cloud will be cloud-native software that runs on AWS EC2 instances initially. For more performance, customers will be able to simply spin up more EC2 instances for near linear scale performance with more resources. Let's look more closely at how the solution works. On the left, you have data sources like Oracle, VMware, or SQL running on FlashBlade, the first F in Flash to Flash to Cloud. Technically, you could also have other third-party storage hosting those data sources. A backup application, such as Veritas Net Backup, orchestrates a backup operation, and it also serves as an S3 client writing to Object Engine, which deduplicates backup data and writes it to an S3 object store. FlashBlade initially, the second F in Flash to Flash to Cloud, and the public cloud next, the C in Flash to Flash to Cloud, starting with AWS. Restore happens in a similar fashion. The backup app initiates a restore, retrieving deduplicated backup data from the S3 object store, passing it to Object Engine, which rehydrates the data and passes it to a backup server to complete the restore operation. So what makes it unique? There are six key features built into Object Engine. First, it's built from the ground up for S3 object storage. S3 has inherent benefits like offering 11 nines of data durability in the cloud. It's secure and enterprise ready. Second, it's cloud native. Almost all other competitive products were first built on-prem, then ported to the cloud. Third, it saves customers money through efficiency. Its deduplication engine can deliver up to 97% in storage and bandwidth cost savings. This is a key reason why Flash to Flash to Cloud can replace disk to disk to tape. Fourth, it's fast, especially when you compare restore rates. Disks are inherently poor at restoring fragmented, deduplicated data. Fifth, it's scalable. On-prem, add more nodes to get faster performance. In the cloud, you will be able to spin up more EC2 instances with Object Engine Cloud. And sixth, it offers a single namespace across hybrid cloud. PBBA systems are not as efficient because their deduplication is limited by what's stored in the respective system. What does modern data protection look like? A picture is worth a thousand words. To support one petabyte of usable capacity, a high-end data domain DD9800 system from Dell EMC would require four and a half racks compared with pure storage object engine and FlashBlade, which only require a third of a rack. And that's with a base cluster of object engine with four nodes. While a 68 terabyte an hour backup rate may seem impressive, remember it's all about restore performance to minimize disruption to your business. It's interesting that neither Dell EMC nor most any other PBBA vendor publishes external facing restore performance numbers. With Object Engine, we've demonstrated and will publish restore performance of 15 terabytes an hour or more with a base cluster of four nodes. What does modern data protection feel like? Today, PBBAs are known to be 10 to 100 times slower in restoring data compared to backing up. With Object Engine, customers can restore their data in potentially minutes. In our labs, we've shown that two Object Engine systems with four A270 nodes total 
can back up a one terabyte database in 2.4 minutes and restore that same database in four minutes. As you add more nodes, performance increases near linearly. Object Engine is equipped with state-of-the-art variable length block level deduplication. It will be able to reduce data storage footprint across an entire namespace, whether data is produced on-prem in different sites or in the cloud. This is different than PBBAs that only reduce data storage footprint in the respective physical system. It also means Object Engine can look across more data to reduce more efficiently. With an Object Engine reference architecture, customers will typically get 10 petabytes or more of logical data in under 20 inches, or 10U. What you're looking at in this slide is a lab scenario where Object Engine reduced 11.27 petabytes of data down to 570 terabytes on FlashBlade, reducing data footprint by 95%. As with all Pure products, Object Engine supports Pure One power and simplicity. Pure One is a cloud-based management and predictive support platform. It sets the bar high for customer experience in the storage industry. Object Engine is fully supported and integrated into Pure One from day one. Customers can leverage the effortless predictive support that's built into Pure One, simplifying monitoring, scheduling, and troubleshooting. One of the main pushbacks on using all flash storage for backup is cost. It's presumed that flash is too expensive and disk is at a better price point for backup. With a flash to flash to cloud approach and pure storage solutions, we believe this notion is no longer valid. First, Object Engine has compelling data reduction capabilities. Second, cloud economics. Instead of having to deploy off-site facilities with replicated PBBAs and tape, customers will be able to reap the benefits of massively scale out cloud economics. And third, Object Engine and FlashBlade enable the data hub, facilitating data reuse and helping simplify and streamline access to workloads beyond backup, including data warehouses and lakes, analytics, and AI. Indeed, there are companies using Object Engine today. Before we acquired them, StoreReduce already had customers, and they are now pure storage customers. This quote is from David Wartell, CTO at IDT. I think it implicitly reinforces the notion that Object Engine helps bridge data protection on-prem to the cloud. The flash-to-flash-to-cloud -flash -flash approach is now possible, and the pure storage solutions that enable it are available, ushering in the modern era of data protection. With flash-to-flash-to-cloud, Customers still get all the benefits of legacy disk to disk to tape systems. They use their preferred backup applications to protect their data, yet they can potentially restore their data in a matter of minutes, not days, to get their businesses back online. Flash to Flash to Cloud can help customers save money by efficiently storing most recent backup data on all flash while protecting all data in the public cloud to leverage cloud economics. In the cloud, data is internally replicated multiple times to offer 11 nines of durability. And Flash to Flash to Cloud enables data reuse. It creates a single global namespace across on-prem and the cloud, and enterprises can unlock virtually any data for reuse on-prem and eventually in the cloud to support initiatives such as GDPR, malware detection, and AI. Well, that wraps up our webinar for today. Let's go through some of the Q&A that we've received. Great presentation, Sean. Let's see, first question here from the audience. They're saying they've barely heard of D2, D2T. What is F2, F2C? A lot of acronyms. Can you explain that? Well, if you're in the tech industry, you're going to have a lot of acronyms first off, right? But D to D to T is the abbreviation for disk to disk to tape. And F to F to C is short for flash to flash to cloud. D to D to D is a legacy data protection architecture, as I mentioned in the presentation, that many organizations actually still use today. F to F to C, however, is a new data protection architecture that harnesses the innovation, performance, efficiency, and economics of flash and cloud technology to help customers solve specific D to D challenges in the areas of poor data restore performance, infrastructure inflexibility, and data reuse. Now, Pure offers technologies such as Flash Array, Flash Blade, and Object Engine that enable F to F to C. And if you want more information about F to F to C, you can definitely go to the purestorage.com web website and check out our Gorilla Guide and 451 Analyst Paper. Excellent. Thanks for clearing that up. Let's see, next question here, they said, um, 
you mentioned that companies are relying solely on their data protection solution to address the requirements and non-compliance with GDPR can spell significant penalties. What did you mean by that, Sean? So to reiterate, GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation, and it's a regulation that uh, went into effect uh, last May, so May of 2018, and it uh, mandates specific uh, requirements around handling private data of citizens of the European Union. So first off, you have to be able to retrieve any relevant private information in response to a subject access request. It's, this is critical, absolutely critical. And customers can typically use an enterprise archiving solution like Veritas Enterprise Vault to do this. But if they don't have an archiving solution like many customers don't, they will typically rely on a data protection solution like Commvault, Veeam, or Veritas. Uh, they have various solutions from these companies I just mentioned. Pure all flash storage technology, such as FlashBlade and Object Engine, uh, can, can definitely help speed data recovery in conjunction with a company's data protection solution. And then second, non-compliance with GDPR can translate into fines of up to 4% of annual global turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. I'm no expert on GDPR. I know enough to be dangerous, but uh, if any of our audience uh, is more interested in about this regulation, they can go to eugdpr.org webpage. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's see, next question here, another acronym. They're asking, what does OEA270 mean? You know, I should have checked the presentation and removed as much acronyms beyond D to D to T and F to F to C as possible here. But OE, I must have missed, but it's short for the object engine product name. And the forward slash forward slash A270 specifies the type of node deployed in Object Engine um, when it's deployed on premises. Initially, you know, Object Engine will be configured with a cluster of four A270 nodes, and as enhancements to the technology within the nodes become available, it's conceivable that the forward slash forward slash designation could be updated too. Okay, nice. Let's see, uh, next question. They said they're using Commvault for backup right now. Will Object Engine work with Commvault? Absolutely. So if you're using Commvault, Veritas, Veeam, typically any of the uh, data protection uh, solutions that we've validated against, um, it, it integrates tightly with it. You know, there's no rip and replace, so you can continue to use Commvault. And Object Engine really relies on the respective data protection solution, like Commvault, to orchestrate all of the backup and recovery processes. You configure Object Engine and FlashBlade initially as uh, the backup target. For more information, you know, look for videos and technical overview papers um, that detail these integrations um, on the purestorage.com website. Okay, excellent. Well, I think we have time for just one last question, and that is if somebody wants to get started with Object Engine, what do you recommend? So that's an easy one. Thank you for serving up the uh, big pumpkin for me as I bat it away. And uh, I'd recommend going to the purestorage.com website forward slash object engine, one word, O-B-J-E-C-T-E-N-G-I-N-E. -E. And obviously, as I mentioned in the presentation, you can also engage your pure storage account team or your authorized pure reseller. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for presenting this exciting new pure storage solution to us today. Thanks, John. Thanks, David. For more information on the pure storage object engine solution, make sure you check out the handout that's in your audience console right there. It is, it's not just a short paper. It's actually a full book called The Gorilla Guide to Rapid Restores with Flash and Cloud. Uh, it's a brand new book that was just recently released. So make sure you check out the book. It's it's a really good resource. Uh, now, while I give away our last two Tango gift cards on today's event, I'm going to pop up this poll question for you. The poll question on the screen says, what additional information would you like from Pure Storage? So just select if you'd like a, a demo, pricing details, if you'd like to try it for yourself. Um, I'd be curious to know more, and I know that Pure Storage would as well. So.
while you answer that, let me announce our final two Tango $500 gift card winners. Uh, gift card number two is going out to Rommel Regal, Regalado, Rommel Regalado from California. Congratulations, Rommel. And the final gift card goes to Harold Upeji from Washington. Congratulations, Harold from Washington and Rommel from California. And, of course, our first gift card winner was Tony Esposito from Texas. Congratulations to all the gift card winners. And before you go, I want to make sure I remind you of our Actual Tech Media 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. Make sure you subscribe to that for the latest interviews around enterprise technology. If you'd like to attend future Megacast and Ecocast events, of course, I hope you do, you can view all of those over at events.actualtechmedia.com. If you're a potential presenter out there in enterprise technology and you'd like to chat with us about presenting on one of these events, just email connect at actualtechmedia.com. We would be glad to chat about that and have you on one of our events. In fact, our next upcoming event is the converged, hyper-converged and composable infrastructure uh, and integrated platforms megacast event. This is going to be a really big event. It's coming up on March 14th. So I hope that you'll join us on that event. Watch for an invitation in your email inbox. And if you don't have one, visit the events.actualtechmedia.com website. Now, in just a moment, this, this event will be over. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and you will be re redirected to an exit survey. We'd like to learn more about what you'd like to see on upcoming events and what you learned on today's event. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.